Good morning. You're listening to Retake Our Democracy, a 30-minute weekly show that airs at 8.30 a.m. each Saturday morning on KSFR 101.1 FM, your Santa Fe public radio station. And I'm Paul Gibson, the host of Retake Our Democracy. Today, I'm going to be talking with Enrique Cardiel, a progressive independent candidate for New Mexico State House of Representatives for District 19, the international district in Albuquerque. We'll get to Enrique in just a moment, but first a couple of brief announcements. Last week, we interviewed Carol Oppenheimer and Morty Simon, two longtime activists who once were very engaged in New Mexico politics before moving to Washington, DC. They are now with Working America, a labor-based organization with a strategy for engaging folks everywhere in the United States and offering a way for people to influence swing elections in other states. You can view our interview with Morty and Carol and all our interviews on our website at retakeourdemocracy.org and then click on Retake on the Radio on the right side of the homepage and you'll see it there along with all of our shows. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge that we are conducting this show on stolen Tewa land and thank our Tewa neighbors for being such good stewards of the land. We could learn much from their custodial caring for the land, water, and air. In addition to working on the general election, Retake is beginning to focus on the 2023 legislative session. And uh, we have a series of Zoominars that we've been conducting, uh, focusing on key issues that we hope will become bills we will support as in, in the legislature in 2023. Last week, we launched that series with a discussion focused on gun violence prevention with Miranda Viscoli, uh, co-president of New Mexicans to Prevent Gun Violence, and Janae Martinez, a student activist from Albuquerque. We discussed what might be possible in 2023 by way of meaningful gun violence prevention legislation and how you can help. You can view an audio record, audio visual video recording of that discussion at retakeourdemocracy.org. Go to actions and events in the homepage banner, click on that and you'll see our webinar. Uh, um, you'll see the recording just below our discussion of the webinar we are having on modernizing the legislature in two weeks. Actually, it's in a week. This is a Saturday. This is Saturday, we're recording this on Thursday. Um, the Modernizing the Legislature Zoominar will feature Christina Ortiz Ortez from Taos, Representative Ortez and Representative Angelica Rubio from Las Cruces, along with activist Rick, Rick Ann Bach of Indivisible Santa Fe and Carol Lynch, co-founder of Legislative Momentum. There is a strong movement among a group of 10 Democratic women state house representatives to to reform the New Mexico State Legislature with longer sessions, paid staff, and paid legislators. We are the only state that doesn't pay our legislators and, 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 and the results show. Our panelists will explain why this reform is needed, what they are proposing, and how differently the legislature could function if we pass these reforms. Please join this very important conversation and learn how you can help pass legislation in 2023 that will help the legislature become more efficient, more effective, and more equitable. And I think that Enrique might have some interest in this as well, as I imagine he wouldn't object to being paid for being a, a legislator. So please join that Zet Zoom webinar. And uh, it's our turn to get in the game now that the, those legislators have done their work. We will follow that webinar with one in mid-August on a state public bank and another in September on public power. In October, we will focus on the Health Security Act, so stay tuned. You can get info on our webinars by going to retakeourdemocracy.org and clicking on the actions and events in the menu bar. Okay, let's dive in with Enrique. Welcome to the show, Enrique. Good morning, thanks for having me, Paul. Sure, so I, I, I always like to let our guests introduce themselves so I don't have to do it and botch it. So how about you telling us how you got involved in activism generally and how you came to decide to run to become a state house representative for District 19? Well, I think activism in general uh, started back when I was a student at UNM. Uh, I was part of the uh, takeover of the president's office for 14 days back in the spring of 1989. Uh, and I've continued to 
be active in a lot of different ways since then. Um, I've lived in the international district now for uh, almost 26 years and started as a, uh, the president of the parent teacher organization at Emerson Elementary, uh, became part of the neighborhood association, became president for a while uh, and just continued to be involved in the community uh, in a lot of different ways, including uh, being part of the beginning of the Muertos y Marigolds Parade that's in the South Valley every year. Um, so uh, I was part of working on that before it was officially called a Muertos y Marigold Parade and it was still small. And uh, so just doing lots of different things in the community um, over the years and, um, and continuing until now. Uh, and so, uh, when the seat became open in August uh, last year, uh, I had a lot of neighbors uh, and community folks encourage me to put my name in for the appointment uh, to this position. Uh, and I felt um, that I kind of set up an expectation uh, when, once I found out the seat was gonna be open again, that, that I had created an expectation that I would run so I felt it was important to run. Uh, community members were encouraging me to run and um, you know, basically telling me, you know, we know you, you've been here, we, we want you to run. Um, and so I took some time to think that over and, and decided to go ahead and put my name in. And so here we are now. So it's unusual to have a progressive independent running for office. Were you once a Democrat? And if so, why did you ex exit the Democratic Party? Yeah, I grew up, uh, my grandmother had one of those uh, velvet pictures of uh, John F. Kennedy on top of a giant console TV set. Um, so I was raised, you know, with that kind of expectation of, of uh, being a Democrat. And I think once uh, Bill Clinton signed NAFTA, um, that, was, that was the last time I really invested in, in, in the Democratic Party. That, that was so anti-worker, anti-union and anti-environment. Um, you know, then he and now President Biden worked on crime bills that were really racist and, um, you know, welfare reform that really punished folks. And um, so I, you know, people ask me about, you know, why did I decide to run as an independent? And I think that's the wrong question. You know, really what it is, is I'm an independent that decided to run. Um, so it's, it's been, uh, I think, uh, that would be 30 years, I guess. So the majority of my life, um, you know, I've, I've not been registered as a Democrat. I don't know if you saw the news today about Chile and their constitution that they just passed, but, you know, you, were, you mentioned NAFTA. This is the most anti-NAFTA kind of constitution I've ever seen. It's, uh, it elevates the rights of of the land and the water and the and the forests to um, to have natural rights, constitutional rights, and that are protected, and it really prescribes, you know, really tightens up controls over mining and extraction and so forth. And it's a very democratic constitution that will be voted on in September third. And I mention it because you mentioned NAFTA. I'm quite sure that the capitalists are circling the wagons and figuring out a way to undermine that election. So we'll just have to watch for that. Maybe yeah, I haven't seen the news today, but I've been keeping an eye on that. It's very interesting. I'm gonna write a blog about it for Saturday. So uh, let's get back to Mex New Mexico. Um, we did quite a bit of research and outreach when we were considering endorsing a Democrat in the District 19 primary. We heard so many conflicting views on both candidates, we declined to endorse anyone, which is where we stand today with District 19 race to be candid. But we've heard from a number of international district Democrats who strongly support your campaign, and these are people we know very well. Many point to Janelle Anyano um, having just moved to the district so she could run for office. These same folks note that you are a long time resident and an activist in the international district who earned their support because of your history of grassroots activism in the district. Can you tell us a bit more about your history of activism in the district and maybe some of the campaigns you took, took on? 
Yeah, I mean, I started, like I said, working, you know, through the schools and the parent teacher organizations and also a neighborhood association uh, and my neighborhood association, South San Pedro, since there's uh, several in the international district. Uh, and I've worked on uh, pedestrian safety uh, campaigns. The, the international district has uh, often is the highest pedestrian fatality uh, area in the United States. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's an important issue that isn't necessarily something that uh, people want to look at or, or invest a lot into, but, you know, it's a high pedestrian neighborhood for a lot of different reasons. And so I think that um, that was a key issue. Uh, lighting is something that people have said for years is important. So uh, I worked uh, for a long time with an organization uh, called the International District Healthy Communities Coalition that started as the Southeast Heights Health uh, Coalition when the uh, Loveless Hospital shut down. And we worked on uh, something called Light the District. So I was at a conference and someone was talking about a project they had where they were putting in poles with solar lights on them uh, to help uh, light up this black neighborhood because they weren't getting enough support for lighting from the city. And so uh, I asked if we could borrow that idea and we, we took it and we ran with it. Uh, they said, yes. And so we started putting up lights and complaining about the lights that were off. There's a lot of lights in the international district that just aren't on at nighttime. Uh, and then several years ago, a young man was hit uh, trying to cross the street at one of these intersections where the lights were up. Uh, and that unfortunately is what it took for us to gain a little bit of traction with that. Uh, and so now currently there's a lot of lighting uh, that's been invested in in the international district, um, some solar lighting and all of that. And so, you know, I, I feel good saying I was, you know, part of that work. Uh, we fought for about eight years to get a, a pedestrian crossing light at a clinic on Central in Texas, um, or one of the UNM clinics. Um, I was part of Weed and Seed, and, you know, there was a lot of problems with that project, but there was also some good things that came about and, and I learned a lot about what, what do I really want to invest in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I worked having young people put in uh, input for Jack and Jill Park, which was renovated uh, probably about 15, 16 years ago. Uh, we heard people talk all the time about uh, being concerned about syringes being, you know, at parks and just on the street in general. So. Uh, instead of complaining about it, we just figured out how to get people trained. And so we started a syringe pickup project, uh, which led to the city uh, initiating a syringe pickup program within the city. Uh, and Bernalillo County also has a syringe pickup program now. And so I think just working on the ground with people and responding to what people say they're, they're needing and trying to find an answer. Uh, and sometimes those answers are outside of government, you know, putting up lights on private property. Uh, you know, you can't have government help you with that, but it also kind of put some pressure, you know, and brought some attention to that. Uh, syringe pickup programs, you know, brought a lot of pressure um, to the city, you know, and county to respond to those issues. Yeah, and I still- If volunteers can do this, why can't the government do it? Right. And yeah. at, at the time the city was spending, uh, they they estimated $70 a syringe, you know, because if you called about a syringe, they'd have to send a paramedic unit or a fire truck out there. Because for a while, those were the only folks who were uh, able to go out and pick up syringes. And so that's just expensive to have a fire truck with, you know, four staff folks go out to pick up, you know, a syringe or two syringes. Um, mm -hmm. So we were able to pick up three or 400, you know, in one pickup. Uh, you know, with volunteers. So I think that really kind of put some pressure. Um, you know, I worked on, um, I worked for St. Joseph Community Health for a while and I, I was a lobbyist with them for a while and we worked on uh, ending the uh, death penalty in New Mexico. Uh, 
you know, so I so I've worked at different levels as well as um, here in in the community. You know, I I was part of the work um, for family friendly uh, workplaces. I was part of that commission, and I I recently was on the commission uh, that was looking at public health infrastructure in the state. It's, it's, it's uh, quite an impressive background there. Um, one of the things that uh, I wrote about in our endorsement page was that the legislature had a lot of good, solid Democratic legislators, but not enough really ardent, principled activists who passionately, you know, get it and are going to fight real hard to get, you know, bold new ideas through. Would you characterize yourself as a principled activist? And how might your approach to serving as a legislator be informed by your years of activism in the international district? I, I hope I would uh, be called a principal activist. I, I try to be, uh, and I, I hope others would say that about me. Uh, and I, I approach things as an organizer. So I'm always trying to include other community folks as much as possible. Um, so I think as a legislator, I would be trying to let people know what's going on as much as I can. I know it's not uh, easy and without you know, funds, you can't do a mailer every week on what's going on. Um, you know, so I, I would try to figure out how, how to stay connected with folks as much as possible. And I think I would um, come into legislation the, the way that I, I do community work is knowing that it's a long haul. Uh, I know a lot of uh, legislators think, you know, from one one election to the next. But if it takes eight years uh, to get lighting, you know, in a community, uh, that's that's four elections for a representative. You know, so uh, you you have to just figure out um, how to keep pushing and how to keep fighting long term. And I think. Um, you know, there's a lot of good legislators that have done that kind of work. Um, you know, Senator Ortiz Pino, Senator Lopez, um, you know, Representative Trujillo, Representative Royval, um, you know, have invested a lot of time in, in trying to get some things through, you know, uh, Representative Garcia. Um, you know, so I would try to look at like how to stay true to um, who I am, what my community needs and, and try to figure out how to do things on, on a long-term scale, uh, you know, and knowing that that's not always uh, what makes elected officials popular, but I think it's what makes the community get what it needs. I don't know, you ticked off some pretty popular legislators in your examples there. So, uh, you know, I, I think you're gonna probably be one of those, uh, assuming you get elected, I, I think you're going to be one of those legislators where you can count on to be supporting paid staff for legislators, because this wouldn't be just staff at the roundhouse, it'd be for paid staff in your district, so that you, you know, you could actually maintain that kind of dialogue, sustained dialogue with your constituents, that's going to be a very important initiative. Um, so, so given that so many 19th district constituents point to Anya Nanu, I can't pronounce her name well at all. I apologize, even though she's not here. As an interloper who doesn't understand the district's needs, tell us about those needs and how you would use your position as a house rep to address them. Yeah, I think, you know, that the needs are pretty varied. Uh, there's a large number of unhoused folks in the community and their needs are very different than the folks who live uh, in the more suburban middle class feeling parts of the community. And I think it's important to try to figure out how how to match those up. You know, so one of the things I know is a huge and critical need in the community is housing. Um, you know, we don't just need services for people who are in house, we need to get people housed. Uh, you know, there's a lot of empty lots uh, that could be put to use in housing folks uh, beyond tents, right? I know there's a lot of discussion about folks living in tents. Uh, there's not another option for a lot of folks, so they have to live in tents. Uh, I think the idea of tent cities is a valid idea as long as we're 
we're looking at how to create more housing. And I think that's where I would look to um, the people that I have relationships with in the legislature to figure out how, how can somebody um, figure out how to support and encourage housing. I think that's a huge issue. Substance use and mental health is a huge issue in the community as well. You know, the international district um, is far above average in terms of poverty. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, a very much working class community. And, you know, there's not enough um, day, day services for folks, right? Um, there's not enough psychosocial rehab. Uh, Las Cruces is looking at uh, a model called Soteria House for people who are going through psychosis but don't want to take drugs. I think we should look at that. Um, you know, I've, I've worked as a case manager and I've worked with children who have behavioral issues. And I think just really looking at creating solid services for folks as prevention to being unhoused, right? Some folks end up unhoused because their families just can't deal with the symptoms that they're dealing with, you know? So that, I think that's important. Substance abuse services, there's a lot of people um, even in the community that have fought against substance, you know, increasing substance use services in the international district or district 19. And I think uh, really that building upon that um, reality that there's that need is key. Uh, get folks services, get folks services close to where they live um, and just help people get back on their feet, I think is huge. Um, and, you know, I seen children walking to school with their backpacks uh, when they were little kids that I see now uh, living on the street because they have substance use issues, you know. Um, there, there's young folks that I've driven to go get their methadone, um, you know, because they didn't have a ride. Uh, and I think that really, you know, having services that are uh, in the community is important. Uh, and, you know, with the goal that someday we may not need to have the, as many services here, but uh, we got to deal with where we are today. And where we are today is there's a great need of services. Um, it seems to me we, that a, a person like yourself who has the credibility you have in the community could make a better case for bringing those services into the district and opposing the kind of NIMBY response. Yeah, I mean, I've done that a lot. Um, you know, one of the key things, you know, people complain about unhoused folks, you know, going to the bathroom outside or just living outside or panhandling, those kind of things. Um, you know, every time a neighborhood fights against affordable housing, they're helping to create that situation. And I think we really need to, to reflect upon that and, and take responsibility for that in, in ourselves. And, you know, people have gone through extremes. There's a lot more fences in the community now than when I first moved here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, for a private landowner, you're not gonna be able to afford to build a lot of housing for other people. So I understand that response, but what it does is it just pushes people onto the sidewalk instead of an, on an empty lot um, and creates more conflict. Um, you know, so really, you know, looking at that, um, people living outside have to face the weather more uh, and, you know, some people have gone as far as like chopping down trees so that unhoused folks don't hang out under the trees. But that just increases the heat island effect, you know, in the community, it impacts people's health. Uh, and we need to be planting more trees, you know, so um, I think that's really a key issue. Okay. I need to take a quick break here and we're almost out of time, but I forgot to remind our listeners that they're listening to KSFR. And KSFR is more important than ever in this age of misinformation. And KSFR delivers you straight scoop news that's based on facts and reality, not misinformation. They provide programs like this with, where people discuss the key issues facing New Mexico. They have great cultural arts, music programming. All of this comes to you free but it, does, it isn't free for KSFR. They have engineers to pay for and a studio to pay for and so forth. So if you've got a little bit of spare change after you finish listening to this show, how about if you go to ksfr.org and click on the donate button and look at that as your ticket for admission to some great programming. They need your support. They're part of our 
system here in New Mexico that keeps you informed. So um, we only have a, a, a very few minutes left here, Enrique. Um, so if you could just take a quick shot at this one. Um, let's say you are elected to the House. What would be your priorities as a freshman legislature? And have you given any thought to specific legislation you might sponsor in your first year? Yeah, I think if I were elected, I, I would really try to focus on housing. Uh, housing connects to so many issues in the community. Uh, people feeling safe, you know, the number of folks living outside. On some level, it's part of the pedestrian safety issue. Um, and it's also, um, for better or worse, you know, part of the crime and safety that, that people are concerned about. So I think getting people housed would be a, a major thing. And I've uh, been reaching out well, to Enrique, other legislators. Enrique, we'll get to your other priorities of legislation in the second segment of the conversation, but we're gonna have to close now. So I'd like to ask you if you could tell people how they can, how you can, how people can find out more about your campaign and your candidacy. Sure. Um, my website is Enrique for the people NM, all one word, right, uh, .com. And we're also on Twitter, uh, Facebook, and um, Instagram. So folks can check that way. Okay. Uh, and we'll publish that on our website as well. So I want to thank you for being with us. Um, next week, we're going to be uh, interviewing. Uh, Gabe Vasquez, the candidate, the Demo progressive De Democrat running for CD2, U.S. House. So we're going to have back-to-back -back progressives then retake our democracy, um, candidates who probably need the support. Um, we'll be back next week, like I said. In the meantime, uh, please stay uh, safe and healthy and stay engaged and active. It's the only way we fix this mess. Thank you very much, and we'll be back next week. Okay, we're back with Enrique, and sorry about that awkward uh, break there in the show. Um, you were telling us that housing would be one of your top priorities as a legislator. Um, anything else on your agenda that you're aware of that you would want to bring to the table? Well, I think a lot of what I'm I'm bringing is really just supporting or pushing things, you know, a little further. Um, you know, we definitely need to make it easier for people to vote. I think that's, uh, you know, the U.S. has an incredibly low voter turnout rate. Um, and so we need to, to work on that. I think um, paid sick leave is good and we can make it better. Uh, I think pushing to increase health insurance for folks, you know, we need to be striving for universal coverage and knowing that we're not going to get universal coverage passed in a one one attempt, uh, you know, I would want to work with uh, fellow legislators uh, to look at how, how can we increase coverage? What are the things we can do uh, every year to keep increasing coverage? You know, I think that would be a key thing. So, um, and trying to um, support our educational system, right? Uh, charter schools are popular and important, right? Because our public schools are underfunded, um, you know, and they're, they're essentially kind of funded to just barely scrape by. We need to really fund them to be, uh, to serve the potential that they have, right? Uh, we need adult literacy. Uh, it's been a long time since I've looked at the data, but uh, the last time I looked, 35% of Bernalillo County residents weren't uh, literate enough for a quality job. And so, you know, increasing adult literacy would be key. We did a project working on that um, to get people to GED programs, and it turned out a large number of folks didn't read at a high enough level to, to be in a GED program. So, you know, we started working with um, Reading Works, which is an organization here that does adult literacy. And so we just need to ramp that up. They can serve 300 people a year but we're talking about 30, over 30,000 folks who need that service. So, you know, we have a lot of work to do. Okay. Well, it sounds like you've got good ideas. Um, do you have any sense of who 
your legislative allies might be in advancing these priorities? Have you had much conversation with existing reps or senators? I have. I mean, and if you look at uh, the folks who endorsed me, I'm, I would be working with those folks, right? Uh, Representative Trujillo, Representative Rival, Representative Garcia, Saranania. Um, you know, and I think, and I probably missed somebody. I'm not looking at the website right now. Uh, Ortiz you know, Eno, Linda Lopez. It was a very right. impressive list of uh, state legislators. Yeah, and, and I believe uh, Senator Ortiz Pino is retiring. Um, and I'm not sure um, how much I would get to work with Senator Lopez, but I would definitely take any opportunity to work with her. Um, she's She's been a, a great support and mentor for me um, all along. So I think working with those key folks to, to kind of get on the ground, um, I've known uh, Representative Javier Martinez for a long time. Uh, he used to live in the International District. He grew up here. Um, you know, so I think um, we would probably be able to, to find common ground and work together. So you obviously have way more in common with Democratic Party reps than the GOP. So if you were elected, would you caucus with the Democrats or remain completely independent and unaligned with any party? And have you had any conversations with Democratic House leadership about whether you would be welcome in the caucus? Um, I think I would clearly uh, caucus with the Democrats. I think that that would make the most sense. Um, I had that conversation with Representative Martinez uh, in the summer when I was uh, up for the appointment, uh, you know, and let folks know that that's my intention. Um, I have no sense on whether I would be welcomed or not uh, by the entire caucus, but I know, you know, at least the folks who, you know, are supporting me and endorsing me would, would be there uh, and be supportive. So I would just have to deal with however it, it goes. Um, but I'm also feel fairly confident that, uh, it's a it's of a better mutual benefit for us to work together than than me to come off as some kind of uh, random aligned person. I agree. I agree. So, um, do you have any events coming up that people might want to to know about? We were planning a um, now that I'm officially on the ballot because for an independent uh, that that takes until June 30th, which is kind of awkward. Uh, but unfortunately, my brother passed away this weekend, and so I'm waiting to find out about his services in California before um, we schedule any other events. So uh, for the short term, there's there's not anything scheduled, um, but we will, uh, you know, once I get through that, uh, dealing with that family situation, we'll, we'll get back to, to organizing events and things like that. Uh, we did have... My sympathies. Thank you. I know what it's like to lose a brother, so it's not easy. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and we did have uh, a meeting at, at uh, a park uh, this weekend uh, for folks who were door knocking and helping with the campaign uh, before I was um, speaking at the opening of the International District Library. I was asked to, to speak because of my role as a community member, not as a candidate, but um, you know, we invited folks to show up to that. Okay. Well, thank you very much for being with me today, Enrique. I appreciate it, especially given your personal circumstances, which I didn't know about until we started the interview. So um, on my sympathy about your brother, good luck with the campaign, and I'm sure we'll be in touch because we're probably going to be making a call on who we endorse in this district very, very soon. We have a few more people we want to talk to in the district, but thank you very, very much for joining me. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. It's Paul. No one calls me Mr. Gibson. <laughs> Thank you. Enrique. Great, Paul. It's a pleasure to meet you. Okay, bye-bye.